very gray, rainy day. Um, I am going to make a couple of remarks um, before I do two other things, which will be to uh, bring Brad Roberts um, from the Center for Global, gosh, CGS, yes, Global Security Research, um, up to make a few welcoming remarks, and then I'll come back and introduce our speaker, Lewis Dunn. Um, first, I have a few administrative um, comments. One, this is on the record. Uh, we are live streaming. For those of you who like to tweet, we actually have a hashtag, which is at, um, or hashtag strategic elimination. Um, please do me a favor and turn your cell phone ringers off so we're not uh, disturbed by that. And then uh, we have emergency procedures at CSIS. If uh, we do have an emergency, the person you're going to look for is Yukari Sekaguchi, whose hand is raised in the back of the room. Follow her. She's fantastic. OK. So um, just a, a minute or two from me on why I was so excited um, to invite Lewis here to talk about this. Um, paper. Um, he does two things, I think, and one is that he poses the question that everybody's thinking about, should we walk away from the Obama agenda of nuclear disarmament? And then he also tries to set up a fresh approach that could capture some of the naysayers, especially those who believe that true elimination is not possible. And so what he calls this strategic elimination approach, and you can dispute everything I'm saying right now, if it's not right. Um, this approach recognizes that it's just as important, if not more important, to address some of the accoutrements of nuclear weapons, which is strategy, doctrine, training, uh, political utility, as it is to address the elimination of the weapons themselves. So when we were, I won't say which exotic location we were sitting at a couple months ago, he told me about this approach and I said, you have to come here and present this at uh, CSIS. It really, I think, addresses a gap in our thinking that few have been able to bridge. And when you think back to the 2007 um, op-ed by the four statesmen, uh, which suggested that the risks of having nuclear weapons actually outweighed the benefits, primarily because of the risk of nuclear terrorism, um, there was one topic they failed to address, and that was deterrence and their belief in nuclear deterrence. And, and that is what I think, um, in my view, most strategists have a hard time with. If you think nuclear weapons have a deterrent value, then why would you ever give them up unless you could magically make them all go away instantaneously all over the globe? I am not suggesting that Lewis doesn't believe in nuclear deterrence, but he does approach this problem of utility and political value from a slightly different angle, and I think that's great. Um, the second reason why I immediately invited him here to CSIS is that he is not your typical nuclear disarmament advocate. And so I was intrigued uh, that he was thinking through this problem. So um, I'm going to invite now uh, Brad Roberts, who is the director of CGSR. CS You're going to correct me, right? OK. Uh, who'd like to make a few remarks? Thank you, Sharon. So why are you here? Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, was the sponsor of this work uh, by Lewis. We're using this as an opportunity to inaugurate uh, a monograph series uh, where we'll try and produce four or five, six papers a year uh, on highly salient and very difficult nuclear policy questions. Would you like me to turn the microphone on? <laughs> she is very good. You're right. Um, so we're initiating a monograph series at the center to address issues across this problem space. We've defined our mission area as looking at deterrence, assurance, and strategic stability in the 21st century security environment. We had the initiative for this paper arose from a conversation with Lewis that was the latest in a continuing series of conversations about uh, where do we go with the Prague agenda or after the Prague agenda? What have we learned from the experience of the Obama administration in trying to move in this direction? Uh, and I think Sharon has put her finger exactly on uh, the reason it was important to have Lewis do this work uh, and for all of us to hear from him today. So thank you for making the time to do this. 
We don't have copies of the paper available today, unfortunately, a little production snag. Uh, but we, will have, we do have the participants list. We will email you a link, and we're happy to send you a hard copy of the report if that would be of interest to you. So you'll hear from us in follow-up. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Lewis for the significant investment of time and energy that this turned out to be. It's one thing to have the ambition to write a paper like this, and it's another to actually make, make good on a very challenging task. Uh, and Lewis was fully, fully up to it. Uh, and, and thank you, Sharon, for agreeing to host on this occasion and, and, and kick off this event for us. Thank you. I'm going to move back up here. Or actually, I'll just sit here. Uh, so I'm now at a disadvantage because uh, I don't have your bio in front of me, but I've known you for 25 plus years. So uh, for those of you who don't know Lewis Dunn right now, he's an independent contractor, but for many years was um, a very senior position at the Science Applications International Corporation. Um, and uh, was the ambassador to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference in 1985. Um, is there anything else I'm missing? And no. just uh, one of the most thoughtful people around on uh, nuclear weapons and nonproliferation. So with that, I will give the floor over to Lewis. Th th thank you, Sharon. Um, <laughs> And thank you for hosting this event. Uh, thank you also to Brad for asking me to write this paper. And thank all of you uh, for coming. Uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes, uh, what I would like to do is to summarize many, but not all, of the themes of my paper. Uh, and I will uh, sketch some arguments that otherwise in the paper are discussed more fully. The new US president will need to address many specific questions about future US nuclear policy and posture, from how to invest in nuclear modernization to how to respond to Russian nuclear saber rattling. Woven throughout those questions is a further question, whether the United States should walk away from the Prague vision of nuclear abolition or instead redefine the US nuclear disarmament agenda in light of today's nuclear challenges and dangers, as well as the obstacles to abolition. In exploring this question, the challenges and dangers provide the, spot, the starting point. Let me simply tick off a few of them. Political military confrontation with the Putin's Russia, possibly on the road to withdrawing from a five decades long bilateral arms control process and reinfatuated with the usability of nuclear weapons. A growing danger of a US-China strategic confrontation. North Korea's steady advance to nuclear armed to a nuclear armed missile capability able to strike the United States. Unprecedented polarization within the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and the real although uncertain and incalculable risk of a next use of nuclear weapons. Faced with today's nuclear challenges and dangers, I believe that a central element of a comprehensive response by a new administration will need to be continued actions to revitalize nuclear deterrence, sustain nuclear modernization, and adapt US and regional missile defense capabilities, all in the framework of strengthened defense and deterrence cooperation with US allies in Europe and Asia. Now, for some persons, that judgment alone definitively answers the question. Yes, the new administration should walk away from the Prague vision, and even from any attempt to set out a redefined US agenda for nuclear disarmament. To the contrary, for the United States, there would be important political and strategic payoffs from setting out a redefined US agenda for nuclear disarmament as part of a more comprehensive response to today's nuclear challenges and dangers. Properly crafted, such an agenda would help to sustain domestic and alliance support for revitalizing deterrence and nuclear modernization, 
leave the door open to regulating cooperatively the U.S.-Russia strategic relationship and to avoiding growing U.S.-China strategic competition and help protect the global nonproliferation regime and reduce the risk of a next use of nuclear weapons. But the new administration's nuclear agenda also needs to be redefined in light of the world the new president will confront, a world that is very different from Prague, and in light of the essential building blocks needed for sustained nuclear disarmament progress, building blocks that do not now exist. Let me turn then to what such a redefined agenda should entail. To begin, a redefined U.S. nuclear disarmament agenda should adopt a strategy of looking long and throwing short. Looking long and throwing short. I owe this phrase to Alton Fry. Put simply, a redefined agenda should, on the one hand, articulate a detailed and comprehensive American vision of a desirable and achievable nuclear world of 2045, and on the other hand, pursue near-term initiatives to reduce today's nuclear challenges and dangers while beginning to put in place the building blocks of the look-long vision. Now, regarding, regarding the look-long vision, the American look-long vision, I argue, should be a world of 2045 in which nuclear weapons have been strategically eliminated as instruments of statecraft, but not completely banned, abolished, dismantled, and eliminated physically. Writ large, some limited number of residual nuclear weapons would still exist, but nu nuclear weapons would no longer be an element, to paraphrase one definition of strategy from my old colleague at Hudson Institute, Colin Gray, would no longer be an element, and I quote, of using all of the relevant, all of the relevant instruments of power as threats or in action for the objectives of statecraft. My benchmark date is 2045, the 100th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because of its great international political salience. Now, the strategic elimination of nuclear weapons as means of statecraft has more specific dimensions, and a few examples should give a sense of the argument that's set out in the paper. At the policy level, Reliance on policies of nuclear deterrence, for example, would no longer be seen as essential to protect national survival, as well as other existential interests, or for extended deterrence. Operationally, in a world in which nuclear weapons had been strategically eliminated, the posited minimum residual levels of nuclear warheads would no longer be deployed, but retained instead in secure storage. Institutionally, day-to-day -day national and alliance nuclear planning would have ceased, while remaining nuclear infrastructure would be devoted primarily to dismantling eliminated nuclear warheads, one-for-one -one security and safety refurbishment, and providing a hedge against unexpected developments. Or internationally, in a world of strategic elimination, a network of transparency and verification arrangements would exist to reassure both nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states of this sta status. Of course, each of these dimensions, the, the policy, the operational, the institutional and international, way stations forward are conceivable. What about nuclear abolition? The complete physical elimination of nuclear weapons. My proposed look-long vision would reaffirm the goal of nuclear disarmament of Article 6 of the NPT, but it would emphasize that the strategic elimination of nuclear weapons is the first priority, and that the road to abolition runs inexorably through strategic elimination. Now, getting from today to the 2045 world of strategic elimination would first require successful efforts to manage and reduce today's nuclear challenges and dangers. And doing so will be at the heart of the Throw Short initiatives that I will discuss in the second half of the Look Long Throw Short strategy. 
getting from today to 2045 also would require putting in place needed political, security, technical, institutional, and domestic building blocks for a world in which nuclear weapons, in effect, have been moved fundamentally into the back room, into cold storage, and many, many aspects of traditional today's nuclear world have changed. Some of these building blocks exist, even if they are in need of constant support and subject to periodic setbacks. For example, a credible and effective non-proliferation regime. Others are challenging, but primarily of a technical nature, developing transparency and verification concepts and technologies. Yet others raise important, but not necessarily unmanageable changes of strategic thinking, developing harmonized concepts of strategic stability, for example. Still others, however, in making this transition from today's nuclear danger world to a world of 2045 that I have posited, still others would require very significant political military changes. For example, not least, first ameliorating and then resolving those regional and global political conflicts that have a nuclear dimension. Not all conflicts, but those conflicts that are seen to have a nuclear dimension in the eyes of the nuclear weapon states. Finally, coursing throughout all of these building blocks is a final one. The readiness of other countries to work cooperatively to advance the look-long vision. Now, different persons will judge for themselves the prospects of putting in place the building blocks of strategic elimination of nuclear weapons. Suffice it to recall that Comparably great political and strategic changes have occurred historically, motivated, motivated by enlightened self-interest, sometimes spurred on by a strategic shock. OK, enough on the look-long vision. Let's shift to the other half of my proposed strategy, throwing short. Throwing short to reduce nuclear dangers and challenges and to begin to put in place the building blocks of that look-long vision. Three baskets of throw-short initiatives are explored in my paper. The first basket entails initiatives that set out the US nuclear disarmament strategy, vision and commitment, as well as signal a US commitment to strategic restraint if reciprocated. A next nuclear posture review would provide a vehicle if you buy into my overall argument about the importance of nuclear disarmament as part of a comprehensive response, the initiatives that I discuss would be relatively straightforward. So for reasons of time, I shall not elaborate. Jumping to the third basket of initiatives, the third basket of throw short initiatives comprises measures to develop nuclear disarmament implementation and verification concepts, technologies, and institutions. At the technical and conceptual level, the new International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification exemplifies what is needed. And the way forward at the technical and conceptual level is relatively clear in principle, though there's a lot of hard work that remains. By contrast, at the level of building Confidence in institutions for nuclear disarmament compliance, very tough challenges remain. From the more immediate issue of bringing Russia back into full compliance with the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty and ensuring Iran's compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Program of Action, to the more fundamental issue of ensuring over time that states and their international institutions stand up for compliance with future agreements. For reasons of time, I should not go into this third basket of initiatives. Instead, let me focus the rest of my time on the second basket of throw short initiatives. Initiatives focused on sustaining, revitalizing, and extending arms control and nuclear disarmament agreements, structures, and processes. These bilateral and multilateral initiatives are at the very heart of the throw short strategy. They address some of the toughest nuclear dangers, and to my mind, 
making progress in this second basket of initiatives will be make or break for advancing toward the look-long vision of strategic elimination of nuclear weapons. Even here, time constraints require that I cherry pick my own arguments. Okay, to begin, efforts to sustain and then reawaken and revitalize the US-Russia bilateral nuclear arms control process are an essential part of this second basket of throw short initiatives. Why seek to do so? Both for the direct political and security benefits to both the United States and Russia of US-Russian nuclear restraint, transparency, and cooperative engagement, and for the NPT payoffs of a revi revitalized bilateral arms control process. How do so? How do you do this? A mix of cooperative, measured, and tough-minded approaches should be pursued in seeking to remind Putin's Russia that bilateral arms control serves Moscow's interests. At the core of this strategic case for Russian re-engagement is making the argument and supporting it with actions that the breakdown of this five decades long bilateral arms control process would leave Russia worse off. Worse off with fewer windows into American strategic thinking and capabilities. Worse off with less influence over US decisions. No constraints on future US strategic programs and loss of recognition as an equal great power. Taking it by itself, this narrower logic of strategic self-interest may suffice to prevent a complete breakdown of bilateral US-Russia arms control, particularly as the 2021 deadline of extending or letting lapse the New START agreement approaches. At the same time, while there was some bilateral arms control progress, even in the unsettled Cold War era, Today's political military confrontation between East and West will remain a continuing impediment to a revitalized bilateral arms control process. Thus, it also is important to seek ways to find a cooperative, mutually beneficial path back from today's slide to East-West confrontation. And there's no a short of success path evident today. But one approach would combine actions to reduce the attractiveness of Russian political adventurism, renewed efforts to reduce Moscow's sense of post-Cold War betrayal and insecurity, and the pursuit of possible opportunities to build habits of cooperation once again between Moscow and Washington as two great powers, particularly taking advantage of historic and continuing shared interests in preventing proliferation. At the same time, the new administration can make clear that not only managing the narrower strategic relationship in ways that would serve both countries' interests, but avoiding also a new Cold War requires Russian cooperation as well. And that if Putin's Moscow is unprepared to join in that undertaking, the United States and its NATO allies will take whatever actions needed to assure their own security. Now let's assume a Russian readiness to re-engage. Assuming a Russian readiness to re-engage in the bilateral nuclear arms control process, it's, I argue in the paper that three possible pathways forward warrant consideration by the new administration, from the more to the less ambitious. The most ambitious approach would set aside proposals either for further incremental reductions or for simply a five-year extension of New START. Rather, it would propose a joint U.S.-Russian zero-based assessment of post-New START strategic arms control. In effect, with everything on the table, both in terms of substance and approaches, Washington and Moscow would agree to step back to explore each side's strategic concerns and uncertainties and seek agreement to possible bilateral arms control actions to address those concerns and uncertainties. To my mind, this is a little bit like the late 60s all over again. 
somewhat less ambitious. Washington and Moscow could undertake a joint stock taking of the many already on the table strategic reassurance, predictability, and transparency measures to reduce each other's concerns and strengthen strategic stability. The goal would be taking a look at all of these measures that have been proposed to identify and implement one or more pilot projects. In this context of this joint stock taking of on the table measures, it seems to me it also would be worth considering what the elements would be of a US-Russia strategic code of conduct. A strategic code of conduct to which there are long ago precedents which could be thought of. Least ambitiously, renewed US-Russian arms control engagement could entail a resumption of cooperative technical work on the verification of future strategic arms control agreements. What are the prospects? Again, Russian interests to re-engage are likely to go stronger as the end of New START comes over the horizon. Plus, I believe that a coming North Korean nuclear missile threat to the American homeland, paradoxically, is an important wild card. A wild card that may well create strengthened incentives in Moscow, as well as China, for more cooperative strategic engagement. But let me defer that argument uh, for a few minutes, because it applies as well to China. Now, turning to a different but related throw short initiative, the new administration needs to convince the Putin leadership that Reagan and Gorbachev got it right. A nuclear war cannot be won and must not be fought. Any nuclear war. Now, the cornerstone of convincing the leadership that Reagan and Gorbachev got it right should remain continued US and NATO messages and actions to disabuse the Putin leadership of the idea that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is a path to political military success in an east-west confrontation or conflict. In addition, I believe that the new administration needs to send the message that creating fears that Moscow believes in the usability of nuclear weapons will dramatically backfire and create incentives for the United States to pursue those very objectives Putin and others in Moscow claim to fear most. More cooperatively, I think the new administration needs to find opportunities to remind today's Russians of the grave risks and uncertainties inherent in any US-Russian nuclear crisis. And one way to do so would be to revisit jointly among defense and military officials, revisit jointly the lessons of past US-Soviet nuclear crises and close calls. Let me shift to Asia. By now, US and Chinese officials and experts have a very good understanding of each country's strategic concerns and uncertainties. With strategic defined to encompass offenses and defenses, cyber and space. The challenge now in the US-China strategic relationship is to advance from a dialogue to a process of mutual reassurance and restraint. Continuation of official and semi-official strategic dialogue should remain the baseline. In part, that US-China strategic dialogue can be used to send several positive, positive messages. That Washington and Beijing have shared interests in a process of reassurance and ultimately restraint. That such a process is not a strategic trap for China. And the United States remains committed to the overall goal of minimizing competition and building a long-term mutually beneficial relationship. At the same time, this dialogue provides a vehicle for the new administration to send the message that building cooperation is not only a US responsibility, that reassurance is not a one-way street, and that absent a Chinese readiness to engage, Washington will take whatever unilateral actions are needed to lessen our concerns about China. Now, let's say there's a readiness on the part of the Chinese to explore a, a process of mutual reassurance. An initial step would be to assess jointly, preferably officially, but 
semi-officially as a backup, the many reassurance and predictability measures already proposed in semi-official and official meetings. Let's step back and take a look officially at best at all of the ideas that are out there. The objective of this type of a reassessment would be to identify and explore packages of measures to address US uncertainties about China's nuclear modernization, Chinese uncertainties <clears throat> about the threat from US missile defenses and conventional strike to China's limited deterrent, and both countries' concern about conventional attacks by the other against its strategic assets. At best, mutual reassurance would become a stepping stone to a more comprehensive process of mutual strategic restraint between China and the United States. Not, <coughs> excuse me, not formal treaty-based arms control. Instead, negotiated understandings on specific restraints, perhaps applied asymmetrically and reflected in political commitments. Now let me return to my wild card. My wild card of a future North Korean nuclear missile threat to the American homeland. As context, I argue in the paper that the new administration should pursue a two-track approach to North Korea. On the one hand, signal U.S. readiness to pursue agreement with Pyongyang on a phased comprehensive settlement of all of the outstanding issues. On the other hand, continue to put in place needed deterrence and defense capabilities. The prospects for successfully reaching such a comprehensive settlement, I believe, are poor, but still worth pursuing for strategic and political reasons. That said, let's posit that North Korea credibly acquires a nuclear missile threat to the American homeland, my wild card. Such a North Korean nuclear missile threat will create great official, military, congressional, expert, public, allies arguments for the United States to take whatever unilateral actions are deemed necessary to protect the United States and its allies. Full spectrum protection. The conceivable requirements list is wide of defensive and offensive, conventional and non-conventional options. Indeed, even before the North Korean nuclear missile threat becomes real, the new administration is going to face a choice. Prepare and begin to take those actions deemed necessary regardless of the spillovers for the strategic relationships with China and Russia, or at the same time, seek to explore ways with both Beijing and Moscow to minimize those spillovers for the United States, China, and the United States, Russia strategic relationships. At the same time, I would argue that this wild card poses a, a choice for Moscow and Beijing. Prepare and begin to take whatever unilateral actions are deemed necessary in response to the spillovers of US actions, or explore ways with, Moscow, with Washington to minimize those spillovers. My contention is that for Beijing and Moscow, but also for Washington, there are strong security, political, and economic interests in, in avoiding an outcome triggered by the North Korean nuclear missile threat to the American homeland, avoiding an outcome of truly unfettered American strategic unilateralism. This is going to be Sputnik all over again. Chinese and Russian responses and growing strategic competition. For that reason, I contend that a North Korean nuclear missile threat could very well tip the balance in Beijing in favor of a readiness to engage in a process of mutual reassurance and restraint, because it would offer Beijing an opportunity to make resulting US strategic responses more predictable and subject to Chinese influence, even if in exchange for greater predictability and US influence over China's strategic activities. Similarly, it would strengthen the logic for Moscow of sustaining and, st and extending the bilateral arms control process as a means of influencing what Washington does. As an aside, here at home, it would also strengthen the logic of American strategic engagement along the lines set out 
above. Okay, time is really getting short, so let me only highlight very briefly three other throw short initiatives within the second basket. Beyond the bilateral agenda, the new administration should press the other P5 countries to deepen and extend the so-called P5 process and make it a means to address nuclear dangers and a means to begin to put in place the building blocks of sustained nuclear disarmament. Here, top priority should be discussions amongst the P5 of how a next use of a nuclear weapon could come about, and more importantly, all of the ways that the P5 countries could cooperate to reduce the risk of a next use. If the P5 countries are not prepared to engage, I think there are other official and semi-official initiatives that the paper discusses that the new administration can and should pursue to reduce the risk of use of nuclear weapons. At the multilateral level, engagement with the NPT non-nuclear weapon states is essential. Given the dangers of today's greatest ever polarization among NPT parties and the importance of the NPT for all of its parties. Given support among a growing number of non-nuclear weapon states, pressed forward by NGO advocacy groups for negotiation of a nuclear weapons ban, this polarization risks become even greater. Now, compared to the so-called step-by-step approach to nuclear disarmament, set out by the United States and the other P5, and widely discredited in the eyes of the non-nuclear weapon states, a look-long vision of strategic elimination would be a much more credible and effective basis to reduce that polarization and seek to rebuild cooperative engagement. Why so? Because unlike step-by-step, step, it offers a detailed goal with specified dimensions, sets out way stations toward that goal, identifies necessary building blocks and commits to their pursuit and aims to realize strategic elimination by a specified date, 2045, 100 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Ultimately, however, prospects for rebuilding cooperative engagement among NPT parties depend most on successful advances toward the look-long vision, as well as on efforts to address the concerns raised about the risk of use of nuclear weapons. As for the nuclear weapons ban negotiations, my own concern is that rather than delegitimizing nuclear weapons, pursuit of a ban will delegitimize nuclear disarmament in the eyes of the nuclear weapon states without whom no nuclear disarmament can occur. Again at the multilateral level, it is time to take a more ambitious U.S. approach to negotiation of limits on fissile material for nuclear weapons. At the least, the new administration should support an expanded scope for a fissile material treaty to include declarations and other transparency measures for past production and existing stocks of nuclear weapons material, in addition to simply a production cutoff, which actually is going nowhere on its own. Doing so would strengthen the transparency and verification building blocks of the look-long vision, and doing so would be very consistent with American support of nuclear transparency. Moreover, when the new administration takes office, if the Geneva Conference on Disarmament remains unable to begin negotiations on fissile material limits, the United States should accept the fact that the CD is a dead end and pursue a different negotiating mechanism. Right. By way of conclusion, I recognize that my argument for a redefined uh, U.S. agenda for nuclear disarmament, and in particular my emphasis on strategic elimination, will be challenged, though in very different ways. Advocates of nuclear abolition and a nuclear weapons ban will argue that a 2045 goal of strategic elimination does not go far enough soon enough. Advocates of tough-minded defense policies will warn that a redefined nuclear disarmament agenda would be used by some nuclear disarmament advocates at home to oppose actions to revitalize deterrence and sustain nuclear modernization. Arguments that Russia and China will never engage constructively almost certainly will be another challenge. Still other persons will judge that even assuming goodwill, even assuming cooperation by many countries, 
The, needing building the needed building blocks for strategic elimination cannot be put in place by 2045, if ever. I think there are responses to all of these challenges. More important, implicit in all of these criticisms is a further question. What if the new administration sets out the redefined agenda? Indeed, if the agenda continues to guide US strategy in this area going forward, but that for whatever reason, it proves too difficult to get from today to a 2045 world of the strategic elimination of nuclear weapons. Even if that is the outcome, I would argue that articulating and pursuing a look-long vision of strategic elimination and its associated throw-short initiatives will leave the United States no less secure and very possibly more secure. Doing so will strengthen the new administration's political position today in responding to nuclear challenges and dangers. Whatever progress is achieved over time via the specific initiatives to realize the look-long vision will help to reduce those nuclear challenges and dangers, not least in the worst case. If between now and 2045, a next use of nuclear weapons cannot be prevented, the goal of strategic elimination will provide an all the more necessary lodestar to shape resulting national and global nuclear choices at a time when I believe the choice will not simply be Let's move right away into abolition. The choice in, in, in some countries, and I don't know how many countries, may very well be, let's move right away into nuclear weapons. Every US president since the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki has sought to build towards a safer nuclear world, not only for the United States, but for all countries. If the arguments I've made you know, today and in my paper and their ensuing discussion and debate contribute to that goal, I will have achieved my objective in writing this paper for, for the Center for Global Security Research. At this point, I will stop and, and open it up for questions, comments, comments masquerading as questions. So I thank you. All right. Lewis, would you like to <clears throat> take questions from the podium or? Oh, I can sit, <coughs> I can sit back down and do this more informally. Come on, That's sit fun. down, have some water. Um, I'm gonna, while you all are gathering your thoughts, <coughs> I'm gonna take the prerogative and <clears throat> be just a little controversial. I have a couple controversial questions. Um, I wonder if, you know, part of me thinks, is this kind of a, re a reverse twist on the emperor's new clothes, which is, We'll have nuclear armed states out there, but we're supposed to look away and say they're disarmed. Um, that would be, you know, you said there are two different groups of people who might take issue um, with your approach, and I guess that would be from the, you know, the big disarmament um, side of the house. Um, but, but when you read, and there is, I really commend this report. There is, there are a lot of. Um, details in here that are very important. When you talk about strategic elimination, you're also talking about operational and institutional elimination, right? There are things that have to happen along the way that, make, that would make strategic elimination credible. So um, whether you call these way stations or, you know, some of them are, are kind of, are, are today controversial, like no first use, um, or even, uh, you didn't put it this way, but de-alerting, you know, putting things in storage. How, how much, how many of these things could be done unilaterally or uh, really require all that uh, diplomatic effort to do them in conjunction with the other P5, not to mention India, Pakistan, and Israel, and North Korea? That's my question, sort of. <laughs> well, first, on the question of whether this is just the uh, emperor's new clothes, that we have nuclear weapon states, and, and we just assume that we don't really have nuclear weapon states. To my mind, 
the concept of strategic elimination is a concept that I'm, I'm working my way through. But, but I think it, 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 does re it does reflect a, a fundamental change. It reflects a fundamental change, uh, not only in terms of the operational and institutional factors, it reflects a fundamental change in, 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 in where nuclear weapons uh, fit. Uh, and and, and it, it reflects a change whereby the, you reach a point in 2045 in which today's nuclear weapon states basically say they cannot get rid of nuclear weapons completely because uh, there are too many uncertainties. I bet today if you ask the Russians how, many, how much nuclear weapons material they had produced over the course of the, of the decades when they produced nuclear weapons material, uh, they probably have not the slightest idea. Uh, if you ask them how many nuclear weapons they produce, produced, they might not know, but I'm not sure that they would know. And so there's a, great, there's a vast level of uncertainty out there and, and, to, and, and so those are the risks of going into a world in which you've, you, you, you think you've eliminated nuclear weapons. And psychologically, I think that's just going to be a tremendously hard barrier uh, to cross. So the idea is that are there ways in which you could ultimately change thinking about nuclear weapons? And, but changing that thinking requires a lot of hard work, partially to, to work the conditions which have led people to find nuclear weapons. You, nuclear weapons are still useful. And, and you have to change uh, the conditions which lead to that uh, utility. Uh, I, so I don't think it's simply the emperor's new clothes. I think it would be uh, a, a, a major, a, a major uh, transformation. And I don't think you can get to abolition where in terms of the, the physical elimination of nuclear weapons until you get through uh, the strategic elimination where they're no longer, they're no longer seen as key elements, elements of statecraft, as means of power uh, to use, threaten to use or have because they might just turn out to be useful in some situation. On, on, the, pus, on the way stations and whether there are things that, that could be done now, um, I have two, two approaches in the paper. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, I think that there are some things that a new administration could do now, uh, which speak to some, th in, in th three examples, which, which, speak, which speak to uh, quote unquote current controversies. Um, one, uh, in terms of uh, the point about shifting to a, a condition under which the sole purpose of nuclear weapons will be to deter the use of other nuclear weapons. At this point in time, I am reluctant to take that step. I'm reluctant to take that step basically because I'm dealing with a, with a Putin's Russia, which very well may believe that Reagan and Gorbachev got it wrong, that nuclear weapons actually are usable. So I don't want to do anything which sort of uh, suggests that uh, I, I, I am less prepared to stand up to my, for my allies and for my deterrence. But I think it would be very useful to do something that the, the last administration did not do, which is to spell out the conditions, spell out the changes, which you think could lead to the, the sole purpose of nuclear weapons. I th the second thing I think that would be really useful, and the paper does not do this enough because uh, it, it's a long paper. It's like 85 pages long. Uh, it does not go enough into what are all the way stations. You know, you can. I think you can. You can have a discussion of okay, if we had eliminated nuclear weapons strategically, one element of that would be you never. You wouldn't have any people out there in in in, uh, in in Omaha doing nuclear weapons planning. You wouldn't have people in NATO doing nuclear weapons planning. You wouldn't have a bunch of bunch of folks in the Pentagon doing nuclear weapons planning because basically you'd be in a world in which you no longer thought that was necessary. Um, but, it, but, it, but at, this, at the same time, uh, it seems to me that the way stations in the paper are not well enough defined. Uh, and, and so I think it would be worthwhile to go through all those way stations and see which ones uh, are the ones you can convince people to get to uh, sooner. Um, I know the third, the third area I would touch upon is, is, is no first use. Um, Again, I think from my perspective, because of the, the interaction I'm now in, in the midst of dealing with, the, dealing with, 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 with uh, Putin's Russia uh, and his views of the usability of nuclear weapons, I'm reluctant to take the step to no first use. Uh, and I'm also reluctant to take the step to de-alerting, another, another uh, you know, 
sort of current thing. But what I do think you could do right now, and the paper argues for this, I think it would be very valuable as a way to address the risk of use of nuclear weapons in today's world, not only within the P5, because the P5 may be a tough nut to get to agree to this, but you could create, you could create a, uh, you could either do it officially, or if you couldn't do it officially, you could do it semi-officially. You could create a gray beard group of folks uh, very senior individuals from at least the five NPT nuclear weapon states. And probably you want to have three, in e three from each state. One to the left, one to the right, and one like Goldilocks right in the middle, you know, in the porridge. You'd, and, and have this group basically sit down over the, and have a task, task at the, at the, at the senior most, task at the presidential level. Uh, or the equivalent. To sit down and over the next year, you bunch of graybeards, uh, you, know, you, you come back to us, the presidents, and you tell us with everything on the table. You put the alerting on the table, but you put, you put doctrine on the table. You put postures on the table. You put everything related to nuclear weapons on the table. Uh, and, you, and, and you come back to us and say, what can we do uh, cooperatively to reduce to an absolute minimum the risk of use of nuclear weapons? I think this is important to do uh, either within the P5 or within this kind of an international graybeard activity, uh, it's important to do for two reasons. One, although I, I argue in the paper and I believe that the arguments of the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons are, are, are exaggerated in terms of the risk today of the use of nuclear weapons, there is a risk. You know, we could talk about where, but there is a risk. So let's, let's look at all the ways we can reduce that risk. Secondly, I think as, as somebody who, who comes out of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty world, I think it's essential. I think we've missed the boat in terms of, of trying to uh, uh, address what is a real concern, uh, political concern, but it's also a, a serious concern. There is some risk, however you want to call it. So that's, what I, that's my, uh, my long-winded answer, I'm sorry, to uh, uh, your short question. No, 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 okay. no, no, it's good. So uh, I'm going to... Um open up the floor and Yukari, do we have a microphone that's coming around right up here? So please introduce yourself and your affiliation and hopefully <coughs> it'll be a question. Uh, Linton Brooks, um, semi-retired. I really like the approach because it's the first that I've seen to try to harmonize deterrence and disarmament. And, and I think, th therefore, it shares two characteristics at first ap approaches. It's probably not enough, uh, and, it, and it's really thoughtful. I have three questions for you. First, I was following your logic until you sat down and you started talking about the P5. Um, is it really credible that this super Canberra commission can do anything useful and then India and Pakistan will just call up later and say, how did it come out so we know what to do? <laughs> okay. Uh, so it seems to me that at a minimum it must be seven, right. and I suspect it has to be eight. And we'll set Israel aside for the moment because I think that that doesn't fit in your so first question is, do we need to demonstrate our fealty to the MPT by pretending the other states don't exist? Because uh, I'm not sure how it works. Second question, I assert that this is unworkable with regard to North Korea unless we are prepared to forswear regime change. Is that part of your thinking and is that price okay? And then finally, I'm a little confused. I understand what you say. I mean, I, I like the vision of taking this out of strategic thinking. But in 2045, we will be just at the end of buying a lot of things that have no purpose except to deliver nuclear weapons. <laughs> Set the bombers and the cruise missiles aside, because we can, we can do those. 
Um, we're going to spend a fair amount of your and our kids' tax money all through the 30s building ballistic missile submarines. And under the current program, building the new ground-based strategic deterrent, the Minuteman Square to Three, or whatever we call it. And how, first, how, what do you envision doing with those things? That's the technical question. And the political question is, how do you envision, as contentious as it is, because you said you wanted to revitalize modernization, as contentious as modernization is, how do you envision sustaining that so that we can put them in the warehouse in case we need them? Well, on the first question, Linton, is the easiest one to answer, which is that, uh, and I think it's, it's in the paper as well, the, you could do this at the seven as well, and you might have to do it at the seven. Uh, if you can't do it, you, and it's because I agree with you that uh, uh, on uh, all these ways in which to think about reducing the risk. You'd ha you, one of the big areas of the risk is out there in South Asia. And so you'd have to have the South Asians, you know, you could do this at the seven, you get seven, you get, you know, seven sets of great beards, including the Indians and the, and the, and the, and the Pakistanis. Uh, with regard to North, the North Korea, uh, yeah, I'm prepared to uh, forego regime change. And I still think it may turn out to be the case that uh, it proves impossible to uh, try to do a comprehensive settlement in North Korea. And in that case, we're in a world in which we're protecting ourselves and our allies from a 33-year-old a, a unstable leader with the ability to drop a nuclear weapon uh, on the Bronx, my old hometown. And so, so, yeah, so uh, yes. Um, on, the, on the point about uh, we're going to invest all this money uh, this probably is, is the area I would have to uh, admit to uh, guilty to your, to your point about it. It has their areas which haven't been thought through enough. But it strikes me that as we think about the modernization of the, uh, the American strategic uh, triad and, and, and our nuclear deterrent capability, there's, there's questions in it of more or less. Uh, even the more or less questions that some people have started to debate as to you know uh, how many how many SSBNs do you need uh, how many uh, how far do you have to go down the path of, of modernizing the, the, the missile force uh, some people would even argue that it's an open question as to whether you need a land-based uh, component and that's so 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 I think my argument would be that this is this is where this is really where more thinking on, on the way stations really would, would be really helpful for this kind of an, an activity, to, to think about those dimensions of it. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm prepared to trade some of those things off uh, down the road uh, if, if necessary. And, 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 and my, if my memory serves me correctly, you know, this is, we have traded things off uh, in the past. I mean, the best, the best example of, 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 of systems that we traded off, uh, you know, with, a, with the P2s, the P2s, we deploy a whole set of Pershing missiles in, in, in Europe, which we're eventually prepared to trade off because we think we're getting a better deal. I don't have a good handle as to how many billions of dollars we invested in in, in basing capabilities and missile capabilities when we built the P2s. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not sure, to be frank, whether when the Glickums, when the Glickums, the land-based Glickums were traded off, uh, did, they, did, uh, did they simply disappear as well? But the P2s definitely didn't. So, so yeah, so, 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 so that would be my response to uh, a good question. Uh, uh. Right here in the front, <coughs> Ben, and then this gentleman. I have a long list of questions. <laughs> Thank you. Ben Tannenbaum, San Diego National Labs. My questions follow on to Lynn's. First, we'll still be wanting to deter people from doing things uh, come 2045, and others will want to be deterring us from doing things as well. So are you assuming that there will be some sort of conventional parity, or we will be deterring in a different domain entirely? And secondly, not only will we have just spent a bunch of money on doing things, but we will need to maintain the expertise 
to do whatever dismantlement that needs to be done. If there's no demand signal from the Pentagon for weapons, why would the Department of Energy want to pay for maintaining that expertise? And if we wanted to maintain any kind of latent capability, how do we pay for that as well? well and the second question, I, I think you would have to spend money to maintain the expertise. And, 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 and the, in a world of strategic elimination, part of uh, the uh, institutional dimension would be maintaining the kind of expertise because to my mind you're going to be still sitting there with some limited number of nuclear weapons and you're going to want, going to want expertise so that you can ensure that the weapons are safe and secure uh, and, and the like. So yes, you would have to spend some money uh, for this. Uh, on, on the question of, of deterrence, part of my argument, and this is part of the problem I have with the whole goal of nuclear abolition, my, whole, my, my problem with the whole goal of, of a great leap forward into a nuclear weapons ban is that one of the conditions that doesn't now exist for abolishing nuclear weapons is that these weapons are still useful in some conditions to deter the use at the very least of other nuclear weapons. You, you know, the North Korea is a great case in point. Uh, but, but I think that, that, that to the extent that you believe uh, the writings about uh, Putin's Russia that seems to think nuclear weapons are usable, nuclear weapons are still useful to deter uh, Putin's Russia. So, so part of moving in this direction, uh, one of the building blocks uh, is you, you begin to develop other means to, uh, to deter. But that's not a deus ex machina. machina. That's not a sort of uh, uh, miraculous way to get out of this you know, box. Part of what has to change is you've got to change, you do have to change the basic political relationships. It's not going to be a world of 2045 in which conflict has completely ended. But it has to be a world in which you have managed to deal with those conflicts which are seen today to have a nuclear dimension. And, and if you look back at history, it's clear that there are many conflicts that have existed where the nations that had nuclear weapons did not think that nuclear weapons had a role to play. Uh, at least, if, if, there's, a re, there's a recent piece that I came across, which is really quite interesting, in which Harry Truman's grandson says that Harry Truman said to him that he was not prepared to use nuclear weapons when it was argued he should in, 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 in the Korean War because he just was not prepared to, to, to impose the costs all over again, having been through Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so the President of the United States, according to his grandson, in this particular case, believed that nuclear weapons, we're in a big conflict, you know, and a lot of people get killed. But Truman did not believe that nuclear weapons had a role to play in this conflict. So to get to this world of 2045, in which you've strategically eliminated nuclear weapons, part of the challenge has to be to uh, deal with those conflicts which are seen to have a nuclear dimension today and, 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 and make more, con so there will be other means of deterring, but there will be, you will have worked the fundamental problem, which, which probably is the argument why some people will, will, you know, come back to my fourth big challenge for my argument that, hey, look, you know, it sounds great, but even if we had goodwill and, and willingness to cooperate on the part of the Russians, the Chinese, or the non-nuclear weapon states, we'll never get there because there's still going to be some of these conflicts which are too serious. Uh, but that would be my answer to your first, your first uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I think once from, test, from testifying before Congress, I learned the longer you answer, the shorter the questions. <laughs> anyway. Let, let me, if, if yeah. I may, just okay. pose a kind of add-on to that. Okay. Um, which was this issue of spending money to maintain expertise. Do we run a risk at some point, and there are people who would argue that's the risk today, right? As nuclear weapons lose their salience, uh, you, you may run into safety and security issues, right? Uh, because they're no longer the, the crown jewels and they're no longer the path to promotion and the services and nobody really wants them and you know they they it's like you know the 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 thing that's uh on sale last season no longer in vogue is there a period in which you have to <laughs> be careful of that yeah I, I would i think i think that that's that's probably going to be a historical experience of the last what uh, 15 years 
uh, is accurate, it could turn out to be less of a problem in the nuclear weapons lab community, where I think both uh, the stockpile stewardship program and, and, the, and the availability of, of a lot of challenging science seems to have uh, sufficed to maintain the expertise uh, needed, even as old people die off. And, 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 but as, as, uh, on the other hand, I think the experience uh, that we've seen uh, with the services, uh, with some of the more blatant incidents which, which we've been now trying to deal with over the course of the last you know, number of years, this, it could turn out to be harder with the services than with the labs. Uh, so yes, I think that is a, you know, maintaining that, that's a challenge, but to, that's a challenge you would have to confront. But that, to my mind, challenge, Sharon, that's a kind of, that's a, that's a, it's way down there. I mean, that's, it's, it's it further is. off. I, I, yeah, I would okay. say almost but, we've, we, we've, we've started down that path. I think some of the incidents of the last couple of years um, Demonstrate. I mean, certainly, certainly, our attention to nuclear weapons, and maybe this modernization program will change that and make uh, everybody excited about them again. But you know, we've we've kind of gone from the highs in the '60s, and you know, coming down. So, Linton, you had a two yeah, or three finger on that. Data. Yeah. All right. And then I haven't forgotten about you. We actually, uh, Linton Brooks again. We actually have data. When we ended nuclear testing in the atmosphere, the Congress imposed and the administration accepted a safeguard that we would maintain readiness to may resume nuclear testing in on Johnson Atoll in perpetuity. It lasted two years, and neither the subsequent administration nor the subsequent Congress was willing to spend a nickel. When the Clinton administration signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, it established a safeguard for when the treaty went into effect that we would maintain the ability to resume testing. During my tenure, we finally got tired of having the Congress routinely cut the money for test readiness, and at the moment, We spend essentially nothing on it. So we have evident, and that's for a treaty that we're nowhere near actually even having into force. So it seems to me that we have those, the Mark 500 program, which is a anti-ballistic missile evasion program of a number of years ago, um, was going to be spend money for something we might need and that did not endure. So I think we have pretty solid evidence that the U.S. doesn't spend money on contingencies. Now, this is much more dramatic, maybe much more uh, feasible, but, but I do think we need, we, the, the evidence we have does not give you confidence in our willingness to spend money on things that we don't think we need. Well, the only, the only counter-argument, th those two are pieces of evidence, and you know more about this than I do, Linton, but the other, the other piece would be the money that we have spent on the whole stockpile stewardship program. And main, and main, well, okay, um, but you'd still be keeping some of these weapons and you maintain, so, so that's, a, that's a sort of semi uh, piece of evidence. But I take your point about keeping the weapons. But, but there's a second point, it's not oh. just the spending money, right, but for, as you describe it in your report, when you know, there's a certain time when nuclear weapons are just, they're in the back room, right? They're in storage. The, I guess my point was, are there safety or security considerations that could come up as a result of that? We're not paying as much attention. They're not high on our priority list. Uh, I think there was a question up front and then <laughs> a few more. Uh, Peter Sharfman, Miter Corporation. Uh, Really, two questions. The first is, uh, if I understand correctly where Pakistan is, uh, deciding that nuclear weapons played no serious role in their security would involve 
redefining uh, their whole national interest. It's not a s marginal thing, it would be a fundamental thing, and which raises the question of how that could be incentivized. The larger question is, if I haven't read your paper obviously, but it would seem that the, what you advocate for next year and the year after are things that would make sense if we have your 2045 goal and there are things that would make sense even if we did not have your 2045 goal. So the question I would ask is where is the first dividing point? What is the first thing that would be a smart thing to do in the light of the 2045 goal but which would be a dumb thing to do if we didn't have the 2045 goal. That's a good question. <laughs> well, on, on, on Pakistan, I agree completely with you. I think that uh, if, one looks at, if one looks at the existing nuclear weapon states and, and looks at uh, the conditions of moving in this direction, uh, some of these uh, cases are much harder than others. And, and in the case of Pakistan, I, th I think that's, that, that is the case. I think at the same time, in the case of Pakistan, it seems to me that some of what, the, some of what I propose in terms of the throw short initiatives uh, address how you might try to encourage restraint on the part of both India and Pakistan, but some of it also address what I like to consider as sort of the, 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 the carom or the third, the billiard ball effect of, on a pool table of the fact that you now not have just, you don't just have India and Pakistan, you've got India, excuse me, India and Pakistan, and India looking at the Chinese, and the Chinese looking at the, at the uh, Americans. And so, and you have a situation in which the Indians are thinking about whether they want to go down the path of, of, of MERV warheads, if the Indians go down this path, it puts pressures on the Pakistanis to move further down the road. So part of the way to constrain the Indians, uh, influence Indian thinking, is to try to work the U.S.-China dimension and influence Chinese thinking as to how much they need to go down this path. But I buy your argument. On the question of, it's interesting to, to, to cut that, uh, you, it's probably easier to, to look at the, at, the, at the actions which would be useful uh, uh, either with the 2045 goal or without the 2045 goal, and that's one sort of list. And what you're asking me is, what are the what are the actions that, uh, uh, if you if you uh, didn't have the goal, uh, would you take? I think I got it right. Or is it the actions that you wouldn't take if you, it's the actions that you wouldn't take if you didn't have the goal. The actions that you wouldn't take if you did not have the goal. Um, I'd have to think about it, Peter. And it's off the top of my, I, I'd like to cut it both ways. You know, what are the things I would take no matter what? And what are the things that I wouldn't take, uh, wouldn't do now if I didn't have this goal? Um, I mean, if I, if I think broadly though of my broad sets of initiatives, uh, okay, whether I have the goal or don't have the goal, I want to try to uh, revitalize the U.S.-Russian arms control process. Okay, if I have the goal or don't have the goal, I'd like to avoid strategic competition with the Chinese. Uh, if I have the goal or I don't have the goal in terms of my initiatives, uh, I want to uh, try to reduce the risk that nuclear weapons might be used. Uh, if I have the goal or I don't have the goal, I want to go through the initiative of of, of, of trying to convince Putin that Reagan and Gorbachev uh, got it right. Uh, if, I, if, I, um, if I have the goal, uh, well, I guess, I guess the, the ones that I don't work that much would be the ones that, well, wait a second, I was about to say that, okay, if I don't have the goal of 2045 and strategic elimination, uh, I'm not that concerned about having uh, greater and greater polarization in the NPT. But that's not true, because I think greater polarization in the NPT is going to come back and haunt all of us, whether or not we have, a, you know, we have this goal. Um, 
Now, maybe this was a Socratic question that's supposed to lead me. Is either to this question either 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 you have your own answer that if you if I didn't have the goal I'd never do this, or else it's the case that everything I have if I have the goal I'm going to still want to do all this uh, all these all these initiatives. I'd have to think about it I'm not, um, um, as to uh, I, uh, which one uh, which are the ones that I wouldn't do if I didn't have. Uh, 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 the goal. I, I, I'll have to think about it. It's a good question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. You, you stumped me for the first time in my life, not being able to tap dance my pair, you know, if I didn't have the goal. I may come back to it, though, in the course of the other questions. So. Maybe uh, some of those institutional or uh, operational measures. Well, no, but, those are, no, but, but you know, uh, I'm going to want to do uh, transparency because I think it's important within the NPT context. I'm going to want to work some of these nuclear disarmament verification questions uh, in the international partnership because we're going to need those if we ever get the Russians re-engaged. Um, You're not going to uh, put your weapons in storage, though. No, but that's, that's the end of the... That's, that's, he, Peter was asking me about things you wouldn't do in the next year or two. I'm not going to put my weapons in storage in the next year or two. I'm going to still have my weapons you know, deployed. So he's asking me about what would you not do in the next year or two if you didn't Was have that short this, term? this year goal. Term. Uh, he's got an answer. Which one would you <laughs> not do? Okay. The, the initial answer I'd have it would be your tactical position vis-a-vis uh, -vis no first use. Okay. If we have your 2045 goal, then we would like to move to a situation in which we could adopt a no first use policy without seriously undermining our alliances uh, or seriously threatening our sense of being able to defend our vital interests. On the other hand, if we did not have this goal, then we want to try to avoid being backed into a corner where refusal to adopt no first use torpedoes the non-proliferation regime. I saw two other hands up, uh, right up here, Dukari. Thanks, Lou. I look forward to reading your paper. One of the greatest blocks to progress for at least the last 15 years has been an inability to agree with the Russians on the proper role of strategic defense. Um, I think this is getting worse. Both sides are being stubborn. And this will become really huge as we go toward very low numbers. Do, do you have some thoughts on a solution to that? I, th I, th I think that's absolutely right. And I think it, uh, I, I, my sense is that's why, that's why I, uh, my argument in terms of the U.S.-Russian strategic relationship is, is, is to actually step back and, and if possible, look at all of these issues once again. Uh, and, and I would be more in, uh, inclined to be prepared to uh, put strategic defenses on the table in some fashion. Uh, now this poses the challenge to my, my, my argument in my paper, which I haven't discussed, and it's not really discussed very much in the paper, it's in a little paragraph. Is, is, is that's the question of whether uh, in terms of congressional, congressional attitudes and congressional support, you could move in this direction or whether there, is just certain, there will be certain limitations. It's clear, it's clear that expertise is much less in, in, in Congress than it once was at all levels. It's, it's also clear that uh, there's a skepticism generally about arms control, and that's been there for quite a while. Um, and, and, and so I, my answer to you, Ed, on, on the strategic defenses is you gotta put them on the table. And the question is whether it ultimately turns out to be in both countries' interests to do so, uh, and, and, and whether the reluctance on the part of the United States. But it's, all, but it's not just the United States. Brad, Brad, Brad has a wonderful paper that he produced in which it, in which it lists like, I don't know the number, but it, but it goes on and on for pages after page of proposals by the United States, and, you know, from the one administration after the next to the next, to the Russians, to work the work the 
strategic defense uncertainties that the Russians seem to have, and there were never any takers. Um, so, uh, but I'm too much of an optimist. And I also believe too much that this, this North Korean uh, really is a wild card. It's going to shake things up. And it's going, to raise the it's going to raise the question, I believe, in all three capitals as to whether there's a cooperative way forward or whether we're all going to end worse off. Um, but maybe it's the case that I was not the assistant director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency for no reason. So, I mean, I've always been regarded as a closet arms controller. What can I say? You know, a hidden arms controller. Anyway. I had one quick okay. follow-up question just okay. on the DPRK and China. You, right. um, if I read it correctly, said that uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile capability for North Korea would make Beijing more inclined to engage in mutual reassurance with us. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be intercontinental. It could be a submarine. Or just say, okay. I mean, what is but, but what, why? Hap what happens? <laughs> well, you've already started to see this. You saw the piece, uh, uh, what, ten days ago in the Washington Post, the op-ed piece coming out of the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on North Korea, in which Senator, former Senator Nunn and, and 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 Admiral Moen have their four-part, you know, solution approach, whatever. And the fourth part is to to, to, to begin to take whatever actions are necessary to protect the American homeland. But when you think about what what would you want to do to protect the American homeland uh, and our allies from 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 a North Korean nuclear missile threat, it seems to me that the the spectrum of, of of military options, some of them having to do with capabilities in the theater to be able to, 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 to detect this capability in terms of reconnaissance and, and, and surveillance, some of it in terms of rapid strike, some of it with anti-submarine warfare capabilities, some of it with regard to how much missile defense you have, some of it uh, with regard to how much, whether you actually turn uh, Conventional global strike missiles, w missiles with, yeah. with conventional wars. So it's turn U.S. It into, responses. It's to our the responses. North our responses. Okay. Are, there's a spectrum of responses that, if we were to take them, they're going to spill back. We'll just take conventional global strike. Uh, it's it's a bunch of viewgraphs and you know and some testing, uh, but mostly viewgraphs uh, <laughs> to turn this program into something real, where you actually, you know, I did work on this at one point in time, where you actually have a uh, an ICBM, an ICBM complex, which has just got conventional warheads on it, because you want to be able to reach out and touch the North Koreans. Um, you know, the, this is of great concern to the, to the Chinese. It's, it's one of the Russians' things they always raise with us. So my argument is that when this happens, there's going to be a lot of pressure for us to do, take military responses. Uh, and that some of these military responses, depending upon how they're carried out, will spill back and make life more difficult both for the Russians and the Chinese, and then make more life more difficult for us because we'll have a greater strategic competition, you know, in, in these. And so that's why I think of it as, uh, 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 now I may be completely wrong. It may very well be the case that the Chinese defense community will just say to themselves, or the Russian defense community may say to themselves, okay, so the Americans are going to do A, B, C, and D, and we'll do X, Y, and Z in response, and we'll have strategic competition, and, and, and so be it. Uh, but it also strikes me that there's an argument to be made here by a new administration to both Beijing and Moscow that this isn't in any of our interests. We ought to try to avoid it. That was, you know. Great. No, thank you. Okay. I saw one more question, and then we'll have to close. Right up here, Yukari. Thank you. Hi, uh, Kellen Moriarty with PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, Global Intelligence Operations Center. We work with a lot of uh, aerospace and defense companies to try to understand what's going on in this space. Um, thanks very much for your remarks. It's been a, a very interesting presentation. I wanted to ask you, um, alongside what you said, you need to think a little bit more through the way stations. Have you also given some thought to uh, what happens with outlier events and how it might, how your plan and your strategy might be affected by things that could happen along the way. Let's say there are those who say that, you know, a terrorist organization could set off a nuclear weapon, or let's say Iran acquires a nuclear weapon and then Saudi Arabia responds. How would uh, your strategy perhaps adjust either your timeline or your <coughs> actions? I, th I think that's a good question. Uh, 
I, I mostly thought of outlier events uh, in terms of a, a next use of nuclear weapons. And, and I think it clearly would be uh, the greatest shock outlier event in terms of the 30 years on the road to 2045. And, and it's very uncertain how a next use of nuclear weapons would play out. Uh, it, on the one hand, there's arguments that you can make that a next use of nuclear weapons uh, could, could lead to tremendous uh, political incentives and motivations to move down this path or to move all the way you know, to trying to eliminate these weapons completely. Um, the other, uh, there's arguments that you can make which are equally, I think, credible that would, it would have the opposite effect. That, that, and it depends partly upon the nature of the use. It depends upon uh, who does it and so on and so forth. That's, that strikes me as the biggest outlier. Uh, there, are other, there are other possible uh, shocks that occur. And I haven't spent, you know, given, given the time I had with the paper, as long as I spent, I didn't focus on, on this. I, both, I basically have a kind of uh, uh, escape, escape hatch, which is my way station's escape hatch, which, which allows you to uh, rethink uh, if need be. But that's a very, other than the use of nuclear weapons, uh, uh, clearly, if there were a major proliferation, that's why I argue that one of the building blocks is an effective non-proliferation regime. If you were to reach a situation in which uh, you're in, after the uh, joint, I can I always get it wrong, joint comprehensive program of action, after the, J, after the JCPOA, and, and the Iranians uh, are found uh, to have uh, a nuclear breakout capability, I think that, that sets back the whole process, and, it, and it cre especially if it leads to more proliferation. Um, and there are probably other uh, wild cards. The one I focused most on, though, has been the use of nuclear weapons. And, 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 and uh, part of the reason I argue for putting this forth as a lodestar, and the paper makes this argument in a little more, uh, at a little more length, is that uh, I would like to have the lodestar at least a strategic elimination out there because of the possibility that if a weapon is used, there will be this big debate about do we all want nuclear weapons or, or not? And, and, and thus I'd like to have some alternative other than just abolition. Uh, but anyway. Well, thank you. That is all the time we have today. I would like to thank uh, Brad Roberts and the Center for Global Security Research for sponsoring this uh, research and uh, bringing Lou to us today. And thank you, Louis, not just for your terrific paper, but uh, for a great conversation. And I'm sure we will be talking about this a lot in the coming months and years. Thanks. <laughs>